Welcome to Mayor Brown's Global Financial Markets Podcast. Each 30-minute episode is designed to help listeners better understand the legal issues that impact their business given the ongoing uncertainties in the financial markets worldwide. Speakers from across Mayor Brown's practices and offices provide their timely insights on a wide range of topics, including finance, financial services and insurance regulatory developments, securitizations and litigation in the United States, the United Kingdom, Europe and Asia. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, listeners. Our topic today is the CFPB's proposal of a long-awaited rule to accelerate open banking through the implementation of Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act. My name is Matt Bizantz, and I'm an attorney in Mayor Brown's DC office focusing on banking regulation. Joining me today is Kelly Truesdale, another lawyer in our DC office who focuses on payments and other financial services regulation. Uh, and we have been following this uh, very closely for the last several years, but for those who aren't familiar with it, Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act broadly imp- uh, permits the CFPB to prescribe rules for consumer rights to access their information for consumer financial products and services. Uh, these rules have never been implemented to this date. There have been some proposals and other preliminary steps that the CFPB has taken over the years. Um, But this was one of the many rules that just was not a high priority, given that it was not mandated by a certain date and and it really provides information to to consumers as opposed to some of the the broader desires for open banking or transferability of accounts. That this, uh, at least as originally contemplated in, in section 1033, was limited to consumer access to information. Uh, now that we have this proposal, though, and I think as, as Kelly will discuss a little bit later, that it's more than just uh, at consumers' rights to access their data, that there are, there are many elements to this that are, are far more prescriptive. Um, and the CFPB has indicated that they may apply the rule to an even larger array of participants that, than is initially contemplated. So let's get started. Um, with discussing the rule. First, the proposal discusses or identifies three categories of person who will be required to comply with parts, one or more parts of it. Um, and somewhat unhelpfully for, for those who are tuning in, it does not use well um, recognized terms like bank or loan servicer or mortgage broker. Um, instead, it creates new definitions. And, and so, the industry will need to identify if it is providing one of the the categorized uh, services or fits within one of the the specified definitions. For example, there are data providers, which would generally be uh, card issuers, financial institutions, or other entities that possess information uh, concerning a covered consumer financial product or service. Uh, This sounds like a broad definition, but it initially will be limited to uh, consumer financial products and services that are uh, regulation E accounts, so related to uh, certain types of payment accounts, regulation Z credit cards, and payment facilitation services relating to those regulation E or regulation Z accounts. Uh, The CFPB said this scope is, is intended to prioritize some of the most beneficial use cases uh, for people obtaining access to their financial data, but that it, um, is in, it intends to extend the coverage uh, through later rulemakings to products like mortgages, auto and student loans, and, and a, a wider array of, of the consumer financial products and services that are covered by the Consumer Financial Protection. Uh, authorized third parties also will be subject to the rule, and Kelly's going to go deep into what is an authorized third party and and what is their obligation under the rule. Um, But suffice it to say, third parties are persons other than the data provider or or the consumer who have satisfied the authorization requirements set forth in the proposal and therefore may access a consumer's data from a uh, data provider. Finally, there are data aggregators, which would be entities that are retained by an authorized third party 
as a service provider to assist with accessing covered data from a data provider on behalf of the consumer. So now, now that we've created a whole new dictionary of, of regulated financial institutions or persons subject to the CFPB's regulations um, that I think many in the industry will not, I don't say struggle with, but again, anytime you're, you're creating wholesale um, new definitions of covered entities, there's always the question of, am I covered or not? Is my product covered or not? Um, but let, let, let's just say that we get through that part of the rule. And so therefore we have to figure out what data must be made available under it. Kelly, can you tell us how the proposal would uh, define data? Sure, Matt. Well, adding to our, our array of new definitions, uh, we have the definition of covered data, which is the information that a data provider will be pro uh, required to provide to the consumer and an authorized third party under the proposed rule. Uh, under the proposal, the Covered data includes things like basic account information, which is a subset of information under the rule that is limited to things like uh, name, address, email address, and phone number associated with the product or service that, that the consumer has acquired. Um, it also includes data points, like the account balance, transaction information, and in terms of transaction information, uh, things like the amount of the transaction, the date, type of payment, uh, the status, the payee, uh, and then also information such as uh, rewards that were earned by the consumer with respect to that transaction or fees or finance charges. And this transaction information uh, needs to go back at least two years uh, assuming that information is available, and also has to cover the most recent information that the, the data provider has available at the time. Uh, one interesting note is the proposed rule is very specific that the data provider is required to provide information on uh, pending debit card transactions that haven't yet settled to an account, um, if that information is available and applicable for the type of account. Uh, covered data also includes information that's necessary to initiate payment to or from a regulation e-account. So this would be information such as your account and routing number to initiate an ACH payment. And the proposal uh, permits this to be a tokenized account and routing number for you know, security purposes. Um, the final points of covered data are a bit interesting as far as one is the terms and conditions of the account. Um, and this isn't something you would typically think of in terms of the transaction information or basic account information, uh, but it includes uh, the fee schedule, the APR, APY associated with the account, the terms of its rewards program, and specifically whether uh, consumers opted into overdraft coverage or entered into an arbitration agreement. Um, and then finally, the cover data includes upcoming bill information, and this is both information about third party bill payments that are scheduled through the product or service, uh, such as a, a bill pay product. Or uh, upcoming payments due from the consumer to the data provider. So think uh, in terms of a credit card payment, your next payment due. And in the preamble to the proposal, the CFPB had noted that, that these requirements are really intended to make account switching easier insofar as you could transfer information about the account and do so in a kind of streamlined and automated process. Now, Kelly, if I could just interject here. Um, I think one thing you're saying there has really struck me as interesting. I'm sitting in a hotel recording this on, on travel. And I'm, I'm thinking about how they they took my my card to hold a, a deposit if if I, I wreck the place, which I, I don't intend to do. Um, and and also it was a card that I earn rewards on. Um, but but some of those things like I, I get there a a financial product or service, but is it really going to be helpful to consumers to know there's this pending charge that might disappear in reverse? And and you know if the the third party uh, person pulling the data doesn't know when it reverses because it's not final. Like that, that just seems like a, a it, I get it. It's covered by the law, but, but how helpful is it really? So it's an interesting question. And I think the, the CFPB has, has focused on these types of, of pending, but not yet settled transactions in other contexts. And one you know, potential use case could be, uh, systems that provide information about current transactions. So if you had a, 
a budgeting tool or, or something like that was that that was accessing information, uh, you know, it may be helpful to know that you know what transactions are pending or not yet settled, especially because they could potentially be out there for you know a couple days, and if you have a hold on the account or an impact on your available balance or something like that. But you know, another interesting point there is I think in some ways the data is just intended to establish parity so that uh, a financial institution or that is pulling information from a data provider is all, roughly on the same footing as the data provider itself. So that the data provider is not sitting on information that it, you know, it can make use of to offer a product or service that you know, someone else couldn't. So in addition to all the data that, that is covered under covered data, uh, there are a few things that, that aren't. Um, specifically confidential commercial information, and this is um, you know, includes things like algorithms to drive credit scores, uh, other types of risk scores. Uh, it includes information for fraud or money laundering uh, detection or uh, detection reporting of other kind of unlawful conduct. Uh, it includes other information that needs to be kept confidential, although that specifically doesn't include uh, the consumer's own information that is subject to privacy protection, or really any information that the data provider can't retrieve in the ordinary course of business. So the data provider doesn't need to, you know, to have extraordinary processes to to make to, to co-locate and make this information available. Now that uh, we've established what data is covered and has to be provided, it's interesting to look at how that data has to be made available, and as Matt had mentioned uh, early on, you know, ultimately the uh, the original 1033 statutory rule was uh, information just has to be made available to the consumer in uh, you know a usable electronic format. Under the 1033 proposal, there are you know, two avenues where this has to occur. Um, one is maintaining an infra, uh, an interface for consumers. So a data provider has to make available, um, you know, essentially a website, something like a, like online banking that you'd be familiar with in other contexts. The bulk of the rule, however, relates to developer interfaces, and these are, uh, you know, these are new. And so developer interfaces are things like application programming interfaces or commonly known as APIs, um, where the data provider receives requests. Uh, electronically through uh, you know a programming interface that connects to the data provider and responds to those requests, and then for specific requests, uh, you know kind of bulk requests of information, data providers also have to make available uh, kind of bulk machine readable files that can be loaded by the consumer or by one of the consumer's authorized third parties to be able to process information on their own systems. And in both cases, uh, data providers are prohibited from charging any sort of uh, a fee to the consumer or authorized third party for this, this access. So focusing on the developer interfaces, uh, since these, you know, these really are kind of the highlight of the, the 1033 rule, uh, data providers are required to make covered data available in a standardized format. And so a standardized format uh, can either be set forth in a, a qualified industry standard, which Matt's going to, to talk about a bit later, or in some other form of widely used format. And particularly, data providers would be prohibited from sharing the credentials between the consumer interface and the developer interface. And this is important because that would have the effect of prohibiting what is a, a slightly less but still common practice of screen scraping, where a third party asks for your login credentials to your financial institution, and then the third party systems kind of go out to the financial institution, log in pretending to be you, and accumulate the information that you would see on the screen and load it into their, their interface. Uh, this is something that under the, the proposed rule would be not prohibited by virtue of the developer interface not being able to use the same credentials. And so in addition to providing this standardized access, so 
providing all the covered data, the developer interfaces will also be required to meet uh, certain kind of performance standards, uh, things like thresholds for response time and downtime, um, including some very specific requirements under the rule for the amount of time that uh, a developer interface can take to respond to a request on the order of seconds, and the percentage of time and percentage of requests that have to be fulfilled within uh, a certain time and successfully. Further, these interfaces would have to be covered by information security programs that satisfy the gramm leach Wiley Act safeguards framework if you're a financial institution or the FTC safeguards framework for financial institutions that aren't subject to the GLBA. Uh, data providers further would be required to establish and maintain policies and procedures, um, and these procedures would be necessarily uh, scoped to the size and the complexity of the data provider, but would have to be set forth to ensure that the proposed rules objectives are achieved. Now, third parties would be able to access this information, uh, provided the third party is what the proposed rule calls an authorized third party. Um, for a third party to become an authorized third party, uh, it has to first obtain what the rule terms as the consumer's express informed consent. And the rule sets forth a process for obtaining this express informed consent by the acquisition of a signed authorization disclosure. And, and in this case, signed can be electronic. Um, for an authorization disclosure, it needs to be clear, conspicuous, and segregated from other materials. And it has to include some specific information, uh, you know, basic things like the names of the third party and the data provider for which access is being sought, um, a description of the service that will be provided by the third party and the categories of data that third party will access, and a certification that the third party will comply with some specific obligations that are required by the proposal uh, related to the collection, use, and retention um, of that data. And finally, the authorization disclosure has to tell the consumer um, how the consumer can revoke the third party's access. Once an authorized third party has uh, provided the authorization disclosure and received a signed version of it back, um, the, auth the authorized third party can access the data provider on behalf of that consumer. However, the authorized third party is subject to a number of, kind of substantive obligations related to that access. So it's not just a free for all allowing the authorized third party to do you know, whatever they can put in an agreement. Instead, the proposed rule includes a number of restrictions on collection, use, and retention of information. Uh, specifically, the authorized third party has to limit collection, use, and retention only to what is reasonably necessary to provide the requested product or service. That is the, the service that is disclosed to the consumer in the authorization disclosure. Um, particularly, um, and very specifically, authorized third parties are prohibited from using the covered data that they obtain from a data provider for their own targeted advertising or cross-selling or from selling the covered data. Um, authorized third parties are also required to limit their collection use and retention data to one year, and this can be renewed annually by the consumer. And if the consumer doesn't reauthorize the authorized third party, the author authorized third party is no longer permitted to use or retain the information after the expiration of that authorization. Um, a few other substantive requirements apply to an authorized third party. One is to ensure that uh, there are policies and procedures to ensure that the authorized third party uh, accurately receives data from data providers to potentially make sure that it's not corrupted in the, in the process of receipt, and that any data the authorized third party ultimately relays to another third party is done so accurately. Um, Further, the authorized third parties systems that are used for the collection, use, or retention of the covered data uh, need to be covered by an information security program that satisfies either the, the GLBA safeguards framework or the FTC safeguard rules uh, along the lines of the requirement applicable to data providers. 
In addition to these handful of substantive requirements, there's also uh, some relationship requirements uh, we alluded to a moment ago. Uh, first, an authorized third party must keep the consumer informed of the status of their authorization. So uh, if the you know, consumer can request a, a copy of the authorization disclosure, uh, the third party must provide contact information in case the consumer has questions, and the consumer must uh, provide specific, specific information regarding the third party's collection and use if the consumer asks. And finally, the authorized third party must make it easy for the consumer to revoke access. And if the consumer re does revoke that access, the authorized third party must notify the data provider and any other aggregator or third party recipients to cover data that that authorization has been revoked and must no longer collect or use or retain any of the covered data that was available under the authorization. Uh, and as with the data providers, the authorized third parties are required to maintain uh, policies and procedures to ensure compliance with the proposed rules, specifically with certain requirements such as accuracy or the policies and procedures to respond to consumer information requests and records of attention. Uh, finally, when the third party uses a data aggregator to assist in access to the covered information, the data aggregator must also be disclosed in the authorization disclosure provided by the third party and the data aggregator is itself subject to the requirements that we just discussed. Uh, regardless of whether or not a third party uses the data aggregator to uh, provide its product or services, the third party still remains subject and responsible for compliance. Uh, so and as we discussed, uh, you know, a number of the requirements in the rule are related to qualified uh, qualified industry standards. And I think, Matt, you're going to discuss a bit more about how these play into the various components of the proposal. Yes, thank you, Kelly. And I, I think that, 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 that before I dig into that part, one notable piece is that um, the, the proposal I, almost purports to not set forth detailed technical standards for compliance. And, and I, had to, I had to laugh at that because as you just heard Kelly describe it quite some length, that there are all sorts of prescriptive standards being put forward um, for timing on retention and uh, timing on how, how, it's, how quickly it's provided, information security requirements, um, processing of revocation requests. So while it's not saying, well, here's um, how a, the, the packets have to pass through the network, or here, here is the way in which the information must pre be presented on the screen, the proposal does have a number of prescriptive elements in it. Now, the CFPB's approach to this is that it is not provide, that, that it is only providing a framework um, it is providing a, a set of a rules for the road, and the actual technical standards will be provided um, by industry, by the industry at large. And this is because regulations in the CFR would not be able to keep pace with changes in market or technology. And so instead, there could, would be some type of industry standard setter who would be able to provide more rapidly updated uh, uh, requirements for the technical processing of information um, or the technical processing of requests. The proposal does not say what would be an acceptable industry standard or what would be a, a standard setting body that is, is uh, permissible. It says that the standard setting body would need to be fair, open, and inclusive. Um, showing that it has um, an openness of its processes, that there's a balance of decision-making power among different types of market participants, that there's due process and an appeals process, that decisions are, are reached through consensus, um, and that it has been recognized by the CFPB as a qualified standard setter. Uh, and I think that last element really um, almost subsumes all of, of the earlier elements of fair, open, and inclusive, because it really doesn't matter what the, the balance of decision-making power is if the CFPB declines to recognize a standard setter. Um, I, I think that this is going to be an area of considerable focus from industry comment because many of the standard setting bodies that are out there today developed organically um, through industry participation and maybe wouldn't check all of these boxes. Um, 
but they do have a widespread effect. And, and if instead the standard setting body was almost formed by the CFPB and recognized by the CFPB, you might end up with a, a far more elaborate and almost slow moving um, type of organization that uh, for those of you who, who have maybe looked on the website, you'll know I'm a former accountant and I was coming of age when, when there was another private, uh, quasi-private standard setter established uh, known as the, the PCAOB to set accounting standards. And it is still setting some of the accounting standards from the early 2000s. So just um, having a standard setting body is, is really not a guarantee of, 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 of speed if in particular it is weighed down by some of the, the regulatory requirements that would otherwise apply to the CFPB. Um, another element though, I think for the standard setter um, approach is that there are often concerns about the, the influence that an agency may place on a standard setter, particularly one like this that is recognized by the, the CFPB. And, and so that raises the question of, well, why is it an industry organized body if, if the CFPB can and, and presumably will pressure it in certain ways? And is, is that an inappropriate degree of rulemaking under the APA, that the Supreme Court currently is, I think, greatly focused on, on both um, the level of adherence to the APA, but also novel structures of governance that, that maybe deviate from some of the historical principles of, of separation of powers and, and also of uh, appropriate due process in rulemaking. But I guess that's, that's really for another day and probably for our appellate group to a pine on. So I'll move along to when will people have to start complying with the proposal if and when it is um, made into a final rule. Once um, a final rule is published in a fed the Federal Register, uh, data providers would be required to comply on a staggered schedule based on their uh, charter type and also um, their assets and revenue. So for uh, depository organizations over 500 billion in assets, or non-depository organizations with at least 10 billion in revenues, um, that would be within six months. For depository institutions between 50 billion and 500 billion in assets, um, and all other non-depository institutions, regardless of revenue, within one year. Uh, for smaller depository organizations, those with between 850 and 50 billion in assets, they'd have 2.5 years, or um, and then. For, smaller, for the smallest depository institutions that's under 850 million in assets, they would have four years to comply with it. And given, given just the uh, small size of many depository institutions, I think they will, will gratefully take every day of those four years that um, for some of these smallest organizations, maybe one branch um, organizations that have the most rudimentary of e-banking websites, this idea that they could stand up a, a system that could respond within within 3.5 seconds in this very standardized format will will probably be a, a boon for the the consulting and, and other parts of the industry that will facilitate compliance. Uh, what are the next steps until that effective date though? Well, comments are due on or before December 29th. So so the, the CFPB is letting us have New Year's off. Um, the director Chopra has announced his intent to finalize a rule by the fall of 2024. Um, this is consistent with both the, the newly found magnitude and, and importance that has been placed on it, um, but also it is, I think, driven in some respects by the election cycle, um, given that rules that are finalized within 60 days using the cat, cat con congressional calendar instead of the uh, traditional calendar could be subject to a congressional review act disapproval procedure um, and so there there is definitely an imperative among the agencies to get some of these major rules finalized um, well in advance of the november election so that they fall outside of that 60-day window uh, I think there may be uh, that may be ambitious, and, and given the other rulemaking activities, and also some of 
the congressional oversight challenges to, to the various financial regulators. I don't know if all of the rules will get done before that window, but, but that's, again, something we'll have to wait and see on. Uh, with that, though, I'd like to thank Kelly for, for um, giving us a great uh, lesson on the proposal and why these prescriptive rules are going to be so important and, and burdensome for the industry. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for listening. If you weren't listening, we wouldn't have a reason to do these. If you have any questions about today's podcast or anything else related to the Global Financial Markets Initiative, please feel free to email us at gfm at mayorbrown.com. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this program. You can subscribe on all major podcasting platforms. To learn about other Mayor Brown audio programming, visit mayorbrown.com slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.